Well, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, for that warm Albertan welcome. I uh, never need much persuading to come here for a visit. Uh, I've been here several times in the past year, including just over a week ago, in fact. But this is my first public speech here in Calgary as governor. So I want to thank you all, and I mean all, very much for being here today. Now this isn't the first time that a governor of the Bank of Canada has come to Calgary to talk about commodities. And I suspect it won't be the last. I mean, it's an obvious discussion topic here in Alberta where resources make up more than a quarter of the economy. Of course, such riches aren't unique to Alberta. Natural resources have been a big economic story for this entire country since the time of European contact. But today, Canada is the only major exporter of natural resources among the G7 nations. Oil is just one part of the story. We're also a major producer and exporter of coal, natural gas, base and precious metals, minerals, such as potash, for example, agricultural and forest products. Because Canada has been endowed with such a wide variety of resources, we've had to learn how to deal with large swings in their prices. Now, I don't, don't just mean the usual high degree of volatility, which is common among many raw materials. I'm referring to the long-term swings in prices that are often called super cycles. Now, what's important to remember is that these long-term swings are driven by first, fundamental economic laws of supply and demand, and second, by the continuous technological progress that can affect both supply and demand. Now, the pattern of a super cycle is very familiar. A large and persistent increase in demand leads to a sustained upward pressure on resource prices over a period of years, and those higher prices act as an incentive to boost supply. So companies act by, for example, investing in new capacity, finding methods to increase their efficiency. And while high prices can certainly spur research and development, technological progress has been a constant theme in natural resource industries. Such advances uncover ways to raise output and lower production costs. And it's because of this continual progress that inflation-adjusted commodity prices have generally been trending lower for some 200 years. Now, the investments that lead to increased supply, of course, can take years, sometimes decades, to compete. But over time, the higher output that is generated by those investments combines with stabilizing demand to bring about a period of downward pressure on prices. And faced with those lower prices, companies then may scale back investment and production. Now, ultimately, those lower prices will encourage more demand, and the reduced investment will crimp future supply, and that combination leads, again, to higher prices. And producers will ride the price cycle all over again. Now, any economy that relies on natural resources is naturally going to be challenged by large movements in their prices. Now, these shocks are more than just swings in Canada's national income. They also force businesses to make decisions about the way resources, such as their capital and labor, are allocated. These decisions often lead to difficult adjustments but they're necessary for maximizing our economy's potential. Now, it's true that an abundance of raw materials may complicate the management of companies and complicate the conduct of economic policy. But I can tell you that it's far better for a country to have resources than not to have them. And even when prices are falling, as they have been recently, our endowment represents a store of value and a source of future riches. 
So what I'll do in the rest of my time today is to talk about some of the global forces that have been driving recent swings in commodity prices and look at how they may evolve in the years to come. And then, just to emphasize how uncertain the outlook can be, I'll talk about some alternative scenarios that could dramatically alter the future for producers. And finally, I'll revisit some of the lessons that policymakers like me and business leaders like you can apply today and in the future. So let's just take a look back at resource prices over the last 15 years or so. Now we saw a large and persistent increase in demand sparked by rapid economic growth in emerging markets. In China, for example, the world's most populous country, economic growth averaged about 10% per year between 2001 and 2011, a period that included the global financial crisis. Now, Chinese growth has meant enormous demand and rising prices for many of Canada's resources, especially for coal and oil, as well as base metals such as copper and nickel and aluminum. Now, as millions of people in emerging markets have been leaving rural areas for cities, demand has increased for building materials such as the iron ore used in steel, and this has supported prices. Now, we all know that the financial crisis led to price declines. Many raw materials rebounded quite sharply afterwards. And by April 2011, commodity prices had reached their post-crisis peak once again. The thing is, though, that rapid economic growth tends to moderate as a country's expansion matures. Chinese economic growth has eased to an average of about 7.5% since 2012 as the authorities have tried to engineer a more sustainable and domestically oriented expansion. In a similar way, India, which saw annual GDP growth near 9% from 05 to 2010, has also moderated since 2012. Now, while it's true that these cooling growth rates have had an impact on commodity prices, we shouldn't forget that emerging markets remain an important source of demand. Indeed, since the start of this decade, the Chinese economy, now the world's second largest, has more than doubled in size when measured in current dollars. Now, on the supply side of the market, we've also seen responses that are putting downward pressure on prices for metals and some energy goods. So, for instance, Global iron ore supply continues to expand today, despite lower prices. But this is thanks to the impact of multi-year investments that were made when prices were high. And these investments led to expanded capacity in low-cost areas, such as Australia and Brazil. But let's talk about oil prices. Now, this topic is obviously of great importance here in Alberta because of its impact on employment and, of course, the overall economy. But it's also important for Canada as a whole, given the implications for national income and interprovincial trade, as well as the industry's sizable influence on our total business investment. So why have oil prices fallen so much? Well, for me, the main reason is that supply rose sharply. And this is thanks primarily to technological advances in oil extraction pretty well everywhere. Now, this includes our own oil sands, tight oil, and the Bakken deposits. You consider in particular the technological progress that enabled producers to tap tight oil reserves. Output of this oil from the U.S. alone, which essentially didn't exist before 2008, has now reached 4.2 million barrels a day. Now that increase in U.S. output over that period is roughly equal to all the oil that Canada produces in a year. Now given the dramatic drop in prices over the past year, of course, the bank has spent a lot of time speaking with business leaders, mainly through our people right here in our Calgary office to try to gauge precisely how producers are going to react. I can tell you, at the start of this year, oil companies were saying that they intended to cut investment this year 
by about 30 percent. Prices didn't recover as much as they were forecasting at the time though. So by mid-year, companies were telling us that they would cut their investment intentions by about 40 percent this year. Currently, based on discussions that I've had personally over the last couple of weeks, many firms are still revising their longer term expectations for oil prices. So obviously the bank will continue to assess what the impact may be on their investment spending and therefore on Canada's total investment spending going forward. But what this all means for the evolution of oil prices is very hard to say. The bank's usual practice is to assume for our projection that oil prices will remain stable at their recent levels and then we use our economic models to test alternative scenarios for the future. And I know that many companies will do exactly the same thing. But that method can be a little risky. Because the vast majority of oil transactions are financial rather than between producers and users, those prices that we see every day tend to be much more volatile than the underlying fundamentals of supply and demand. But before I move on, let me emphasize a point. Lower prices for base metals and oil today do not mean that long-term investments, which may take years to complete and last for decades, were somehow a mistake. Without those investments, we would never have been able to capitalize on the higher prices, which boosted Canada's aggregate income. And what matters for a given investment is how prices evolve over the entire life of the project. And that's impossible to know when long-term investment decisions must be made. Just to illustrate, from the end of 2008 to the end of 2010, just two years, the price of copper tripled. Oil and nickel prices more than doubled in that time. So if you believe in market forces, as I do, these movements represented a clear signal for companies to invest and expand output. And those were able to recognize the opportunity, make adjustments, and exploit the higher prices were rewarded. And the increased income brought important benefits to Canada's entire economy. Now let me spend some time talking about the future. The price cycle that I've sketched out might appear to be fairly predictable. But history has repeatedly shown that new technologies can quickly upend assumptions about future demand and supply for almost any resource. So for example, back in the 1970s, there were predictions that the world would run out of copper by the end of the century. The people who made that forecast did not foresee that copper wire, which was long a staple of communications infrastructure, would be replaced by fiber optic cable with its glass threads made from silica. Now this technology helped reduce the demand for copper, in essence extending its supply for a very long time. In a similar way, digital photography has had a dramatic impact on photo processing. Now, 20 years ago, just imagine the idea that everybody would carry around telephones that were also good quality cameras. That was ridiculous. People took pictures with cameras that were loaded with film, and they took the film to a developer. The processing of the film consumed a lot of silver. And back then, if you didn't anticipate the emergence of digital photography, you might have expected this source of demand would continue indefinitely. Indeed, the use of silver in photography peaked in 1999 and has fallen by almost 80 percent, 80 percent since then. So it's these sorts of technological advances that make predictions about future demand or supply extremely difficult. But it's also these technological advances, combined with Canada's many gifts of natural resources, that will generate the opportunities to secure our future prosperity. Our goods will remain in demand. We will continue to have lumber for houses, 
metals for industrial production, oil for use in plastics, and let's face it, it's hard to imagine that Canadian roads won't continue to need to be patched up with new asphalt. But further, it's important to remember that Canada's endowment is extremely diverse. While the cycles for base metals and oil have turned lower, there's still substantial demand that's supporting the prices of many agricultural goods, for example. As I noted, with continued growth in emerging markets, their populations are becoming increasingly urbanized. Here in North America, over 80%, 82% of the population lives in urban areas. Now that compares with only 55% in China and just 30% in other emerging markets such as India. Now this trend toward urbanization is likely to continue. And with it will come growing demand for all the goods linked to household consumption, and especially agricultural products. You consider the hundreds of millions of people who are climbing the income scale in India and in China, and their changing diet implies much more than just stronger demand for traditional protein sources. It also implies demand for inputs that we have, such as fertilizers, animal feed, fish feed, oil seeds, specialty crops such as lentils and chickpeas. And as I saw, the latest traffic figures from Port Metro Vancouver show sharp growth in shipments of wheat, especially crops, solid gains in meat, poultry, and potash out into Asia. Now Canada is particularly well placed to tap growing demand for fish and other seafood. Now Canadian seafood exports to China in the first half of this year grew by 11% compared with the same period last year. To take one example, 60,000 lobsters are flown from Halifax to Shanghai every week. Now this business has been aided by advances in technology, whether it's in shipping or in production. And thanks in part to this demand, lobster prices have been rising sharply. But in terms of aquaculture, however, there appears to be considerable more growth potential. Muscle farming grew by about 35% over the last five years or so. Farmed salmon production has more or less plateaued around 100,000 100, tons a year. But Canada has more coastline than any other country in the world. Yet the volume of our farmed seafood output is dwarfed by countries such as Norway, which produces seven times as much as Canada does. Now I'll leave it to others to figure out how best to tap this potential resource. But there are others, just to mention others. Rare earth minerals, the 17 elements used in high-tech products such as cell phones and hybrid vehicles, these represent another potential source of new growth for Canadians over time. Now it's impossible to know with certainty where opportunities will emerge 30 years from now. What new technological advances lie just over the horizon? Consider, for example, the future of water desalination. Right now, the process of removing salt from seawater is too energy intensive to be economically feasible on a large scale. But you don't know. Perhaps we're just one technological breakthrough away from solving this problem. And imagine the impact if the chronic droughts plaguing Western North America and Australia could be eased by simply desalinating, desalinating ocean water. Well, the point of this narrative is not to educate you on all these possibilities, but to emphasize just how uncertain the future is. Businesses, consumers, governments, policymakers, we must all plan for the future based on the best information we have. And at the same time, natural uncertainty requires us to be flexible, to adapt to circumstances that can change rapidly. In concrete terms, this means business leaders must be aware of the risks involved in resource production, manage those risks as best they can, and be ready to react to market signals and seize opportunities. Now history has shown that the companies that are nimble are the ones that are best poised to thrive over time. And policymakers can help 
policymakers can help in these efforts by encouraging economic flexibility. This means allowing the necessary adjustments to take place. It means not frustrating flows of investment or flows of labor from one region to another. Canada's labor market showed impressive flexibility when oil prices were rising as workers flocked to Alberta to fill demand. And in our latest Business Outlook survey, the bank saw evidence of labor shortages beginning to ease in regions where some interprovincial workers are returning from the oil patch. But before I conclude, let me say a few words about how monetary policy fits into this picture. There are lessons that we can take from previous price cycles. Now, the most important of these is the value of our monetary policy framework. Now, we can't do much about resource price shocks, but our policy can help the economy adjust to them. Now, in particular, our floating exchange rate helps absorb some of the impact of these price movements and it sends signals that facilitate future adjustments. Now, you think back to the previous decade, from 2002 to 2012, oil prices rose from about $25 per barrel to more than $100 a barrel. And that led to a big jump in our national income. But over that same period, the Canadian dollar appreciated from a record low of around 62 cents to above parity with the US dollar. And what that did was to help reduce the inflationary risks that came with the stronger growth and the increased income. Now similarly, over the past year, both oil prices and the Canadian dollar have fallen sharply. The floating currency again is helping to reduce the disinflationary risks that have come with that cut in our national income. Further, allowing the currency to float frees up the Bank of Canada to concentrate our single policy tool on our single target, which is inflation. And if we tried to offset these currency movements, we would end up frustrating the natural shifts in economic resources. Now, by focusing on our mandate to keep inflation low and stable and predictable, the bank has built up credibility. So Canadians have well-anchored inflation expectations, even in the face of large price swings. For example, when we've seen big moves in energy costs, such as the price of gasoline, there's been little evidence that consumers adjusted their overall inflation expectations, either upward or downward. Well, why is that important? Well, since Canadians see our commitment to our target as credible, that makes it much easier for us to reach our mandated goal without needing big swings in output or interest rates. So those of you who are as old as I am can recall our experience with the oil price shock of the 1970s. And you remember the subsequent effort that was required to bring inflation under control. At that time, without a credible target and with unanchored inflation expectations, inflation soared. Extremely high interest rates were needed to get price increases back under control. Now another point to remember is that swings in commodity prices can affect the normal relationship between the total inflation rate and what we call our core measure of inflation. For example, total inflation today is being pushed down by the impact of lower energy costs, in contrast, core inflation, which strips out those volatile components, is facing upward pressure because recent declines in the exchange rate are boosting the prices of imported goods. However, we expect all of these to be one-off effects, and as such, we look through them. As we noted in our July Monetary Policy Report, when all the temporary factors are stripped out, the underlying trend in inflation in Canada is in the range of 1.5 to 1.7%, which is a little below our 2% target. Now, given these complications, the bank is looking now at how we measure core inflation. This is part of our regular review of our inflation targeting regime. Next year, 
will answer the question of whether the bank should continue to focus on one preeminent measure of core inflation, and if so, whether our current core measure will remain in that role. In our interest rate announcement earlier this month, the bank noted that the resource sector is continuing to adjust to lower prices and that these complex adjustments will take considerable time. Our inflation targeting regime will help to facilitate those adjustments. Canada has seen this movie before. We've managed it well in the past, and I'm confident that we'll continue to manage it well in the future. It's time for me to conclude. As Albertans know well, it can be hard to ride the cycles in raw materials prices. The resource price fluctuations affect all countries, whether they're consumers or whether they're producers. Canada is actually very fortunate to be both, and we shouldn't ignore the resources that we have been blessed with. Natural resources bring opportunities. Over the years, Canadians have used our endowment to build a prosperous economy, and we will continue to do so. And rather than resist market forces, Canadians should heed the signals sent by those price movements. We've adjusted to rising prices, we can adjust to falling ones. Now these adjustments are never easy. They're often difficult, and certainly they're painful for affected individuals and for their families but they are necessary. For our part, the Bank of Canada will continue to promote low, stable, and predictable inflation, and doing so is the best contribution that we can make to helping promote both strong, steady economic growth and the flexibility needed to ease those adjustments and help our resource-rich country thrive. I thank you very much. Thank you, Governor Polaz, and thank you to all of you who have been emailing in questions. We have another 10 or 15 minutes with the Governor this afternoon, so we'll pose some of these questions. First of all, how long will it take for the super cycle in oil to turn up? Oh my goodness. Uh, what's the next question? <laughs> no, no, seriously, what's the next question? Okay, no, I'll, I'll give it a shot. Well, that's, uh, of course, I, I told you enough to know, I don't know the answer to that question. But, but the point thing is that uh, we know that these low prices are affecting both demand and supply. And so when we ask ourselves, you know, how much of an overhang of supply is there today? It varies, that estimate varies from uh, analyst to analyst, but it's not an unlimited amount. And so we've got demand continuing to grow and arguably is picking up speed because the world actually is picking up speed. And so that plus the lower price is causing demand to grow. And of course there are areas where I suppose supply will be curtailed, you know, uh, at these low prices, uh, certain examples uh, in tight oil plays perhaps in the US. But that combination is the kind of combination which takes a while to happen, but then you reach a new state in which things are more normal. I don't want to hazard a guess of when that would be. It's going to take some time. And I, won't, I certainly won't mention a number as to where it might settle out. But there's more experts uh, in this room on oil than you can shake a stick at, so I'll leave it to them. Todd and Glenn mentioned this a little bit when they were speaking, uh, the outlook for China. What do you think it is, and could we see growth there that would help oil prices? Sure. Uh, yeah, China is actually growing quite well. Um, What's happening in China is that it's, it's gearing down to a more sustainable pace for the longer term, which uh, maturing economies always do. Uh, those of you who are old enough to remember uh, what Japan did, you know, in 1960, Japan was at about 25% of the U.S. standard of living, and 30 years later, they caught up to the United States. That 30-year growth cycle started off really fast and gradually settled down to a slower growth pace. And that's what's happening in China. We're only partway through that. And so this is Mother Nature at work. But the fact is that Japan, or excuse me, China, is like twice as big as it was six or seven years ago. 
So it's demanding more of everything. The fact that its growth rate has slowed down a little bit shouldn't be the thing that bothers us so much. The question is how much more can we continue to sell to them? And uh, furthermore, I don't think they're slowing down nearly the way we've been, we, we, we think they might be. You know, we get a lot of chatter about how dramatic the slowdown is. It is not uh, very dramatic. It's a natural process. And the urbanization trend continues and is likely to continue to be resource intensive for a very long time. So I'm actually quite optimistic about China and what it means for us. What do you mean by financial transactions in oil and how does that affect oil companies? Oh, okay. So, um, so what I'm referring to there is something like 90% of the transactions that take place in the spot futures market for oil are, are financial. There are people that uh, use the word bet several times a day. Um, and so that's okay because they provide an essential service, which is to put liquidity in the market that give uh, companies the ability to hedge future sales and stuff like that. So it has a very uh, important contribution to how the market works. But the other side of it is that when there is a news item, such as you read, it, you read a headline that says, oh my gosh, China's slowing down, uh, there's a tendency for there to be excessive volatility, which is much greater than the movements in the underlying fundamentals of supply and demand. That's all I mean by that. So it just means that you can't just take the recent price as the be-all and end-all, and we kind of take an average over several months to forecast it out, and then we say, well, suppose it's $20 higher, or suppose it's lower. We test those things with our models so that we can put a bracket around how monetary policy needs to be prepared for alternative scenarios. These are all good questions. You guys were listening very really closely. Really good questions. <laughs> Are you saying that Alberta and Canada are too reliant on commodities, and is there a risk of Dutch disease? Wow. Um, I don't like that term very much. Um, so, but, but, but really, the question is, are we too reliant? I mean, like I said, you've got to believe it's better to have some of this stuff than not to have that stuff. So when there's an oil price shock, if you're not a producer country, well, it means if it's an upside, that's bad news for your economy. And if it's down, it's good news for your economy. Uh, when you produce it, it's the other way around. So no matter where you are, you have to adjust when prices move. Um, and in terms of being excessively dependent, I don't buy that. Like 20% of our economy is the resource economy. Uh, that's very important. It's our backbone. It's always been our history. And the rest is in some way dependent on that continuing to perform. But we're a highly diversified economy. And uh, we should be thankful that we've got resources as part of our diversification, uh, whereas lots of other countries don't have that. So I don't, I don't fret about it. What it means to me is that what we need to do is understand it what are the forces that are being thrown up, and how is the economy adjusting to those forces? And some of those adjustments, frankly, they're, they, they're difficult for people. Ordinary people have to move, or they lose their job, they have to look for another job. We're a bit encouraged, actually, in the past uh, year. The labor market in Canada has become much more vibrant, uh, more dynamic. There are more jobs, so it's more turnover people voluntarily move, leaving their job to get another job, which is sort of a trading up process. And so we're encouraged that the labor market is beginning to work much better than it was a year or two ago. So all that to say, we have the ingredients to adjust to this, as we have in the past. And it feels to me like companies are adjusting more quickly this time around than they did, say, in the mid-80s, for instance, uh, to uh, something of, which is fairly similar. Uh, for one thing, having commuting laborers, you know, and uh, that, that's helping the adjustment process, and there happens to be job opportunities back home. So all that to say, I, I, reject, I reject the premise of the question, but I hope that answer is good enough. We've got one more question here. I'm sure everyone is hoping that you'll agree with Todd and Glenn on this one and answer no, but we'll see what you think. What are the chances that oil will fall to $20 a barrel like Goldman Sachs says? Oh, oh, I see. Well, 
Todd, Todd said no? <laughs> okay, I agree. I, I guess, you know what, I have to, I have to agree with Todd because he's sitting right there. <laughs> but, but seriously, I don't want to put, my, put a pin in any kind of a forecast like that. Um, but as I said before, to me, you can see the forces that are acting, and they're acting in a way fairly rapidly, which suggests that both demand is growing and supply is likely to contract. And even if it doesn't, it would only take a re reasonably short time to work off the overhang of supply. So in that situation, you know, like I said, in our forecast, we find it convenient to just assume that it stays where it is, and then we'll analyze, well, what if it's higher, you know, so that we understand the implications. That's better for us, because our job is not uh, that. Our job is the monetary policy part. We have to be ready for anything. Uh, so if you'll forgive me, I won't agree or disagree to any specific number, and I'll leave that to guys like Todd and Glenn. Those are the real forecasters. Governor Polas, thank you for your time and for your okay. insight today. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much, folks.